No, 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 does that sound more logical to you? You know what I call it? What? It's multi-excuse theory. <laughs> yeah. We are Christians. We are committed to that. We believe it's truth. We know it's truth. I know it looks designed, but it isn't designed. <laughs> it's not that the evidence isn't there. And now, the flaming sword. going pretty good. In fact, I came up with a little saying just for you. <laughs> Everyone knows how much I like to be super swell. And here it is. Super swell is doing well. <laughs> hey, Woo! Well, I like that. That's pretty good. Huh? We're going to have to add that in. You, you do realize you became super swell Joe now. That's right. I mean, that Absolutely. is your, <laughs> that's your handle. Who else can claim that title though? <laughs> See, that's the thing. Now, I don't know what my handle is yet. <laughs> Based on my philosophical arguments, it's a super poor <laughs> apologist. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is our 10th podcast. That is awesome. That is awesome. Yay, and, uh, for, yay for us. We hope we can make at least 10 more. <laughs> that's the goal. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's, we actually just come off of a uh, podcast with Carmine Hetrick, a, a very good podcast, but what people don't know is it was almost a disaster because we had very poor internet feed. Carmine, we actually lost Carmine and you were on it. Like both of us seen him freeze up <laughs> and, and he, we lost him and you just kept talking. And when I got to the final edit, it was a mess. And so it, overall, though, we put together a podcast. I was able to edit it down, and, and it's a good podcast. He discusses prophecies of Christ, and we only got through three. We were hoping to get through more, and that, that was a lot of that had to do with our, our difficulties, but it was good. It was still yep. fun. And leading up to that, we started with the evidence for God. We talked about intelligent design twice now, I believe. Carmine uh, was actually in one of those. Uh, you and I went through manuscript evidence, and we talked about scientific evidence. And we did do one podcast with James Wagley on Lord, Liar, and Lunatic. That's or Lunatic, not and. Whose side are you on? <laughs> <laughs> that was a good one. And so that was getting more into scripture, but we thought we'd kind of put a capstone on some of the apologetics talking about the evidence for God, because one of the questions then, as, as we bring out all this evidence that people ask is, okay, who created God? Right. And that's um, what we're going to be talking about a lot Today, touched on it a little bit in another podcast where I think we played a William Lane Craig clip, and that might have been one of his points, but we just, we just touched on it. So we're going to hit it today. And what people may not know, this is another guy we've mentioned before, but Richard Dawkins, who's a, a pretty famous evolutionary biologist from England. <laughs> I, for some reason, I knew that, but on a previous podcast, for some reason, I wanted him to be from the United States, but uh, he's from England. You got it. Probably one of the well, most well-known atheists, very outspoken, uh, very unapologetic about the kinds of things he says about not just Christians, but people of various faiths. And um, he wrote a book in 2006 called The God Delusion. And this book had a tremendous impact on our culture, I believe. It sold about 3 million copies, made number four on the New York Times bestseller list. And one of his main contentions was asking the, the question that you just asked, who made God? And in fact, Dawkins goes so far in that book as to say, if a Christian can't answer that question right, that our whole faith falls apart. And what I'm going to try to show in the next few minutes is not only is he wrong in that, but that even the question that he asks doesn't make sense. So, and we, we called you know, Richard to see if he'd come on and dialogue and debate me, but he refused. <laughs> Of course, this is always relevant because when you start looking at the apologetics, people realize, okay, I see your evidence. I see what you're saying, but let's go back even further. Let's go back and, and this God that you say you believe in, how did he get here? What is the, the answer to that question? And so we're going to talk about that, but I assume you probably have something <laughs> funny because if you don't, you know the audience is going to be disappointed. So we have, yeah. to, uh, we have to have something here. Well, I thought this is particularly good for me because of what I, of what I uh, do for my vocation. But one Sunday morning, a mother went in to wake up her son and tell him it was time to get ready for church. He said, I'm not going. She said, why not? He said, I'll give you two good reasons. He said, one, they don't like me. And two, I don't like them. And his mother replied, well, I'll give you two good reasons why you should go to church. One, you're 59 years old. And two, you're the pastor. So <laughs> <laughs> no, well, there you good. go. Yeah. So, I so actually, I'm, not, I'm, 
not, I'm not quite 59 yet, but other than that, I, I fit right in there. You know what made that one good? My delivery? No, I actually really <laughs> laughed. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> like I didn't have to make it up for some of that's your other. Right. Uh, that's uh, right. Well, anyway, so. Oh, man. Yeah, that, that's funny. I actually did. I actually laughed, Joe. So well, you good. know what? That's an improvement. You're getting better. Your, <laughs> your, your delivery was good. So maybe that was it. Maybe that that's was part of it. it. All right. So when you're ready to roll, Joel, like, hey, there's another name hey. for you. Ready to roll, Joel. <laughs> Joel, I got all kinds of them. Ready to roll. I just want to mention something. Um, that this is another quote from Mark Twain. But he said at one time that a lie gets halfway around the world before truth has a chance to put his boots on. I love that quote because what happens, and it ties right into what we're talking about today, but a well-known atheist or maybe a skeptic, they'll just throw something out there like, well, if you can't figure out who made God, your whole faith falls apart, or they'll just kind of throw out these huge statements. And a lot of times people won't look into the evidence for themselves. That's why I think what we're doing in this podcast is so important. So just for people who are listening to it, thank you. Please share it. Get it out there because we want to equip Christians that maybe don't have the time to do the research we're doing, or we want to help them give answers. And so just want to mention that when you hear something from a skeptic or an atheist, don't just assume, well, that must be true. Dig into it a little bit. Let me Go just add, add to that because we do joke, we have fun, but we are serious. This is a labor of love. We, we yep. do believe in Christ. We are Christians. We are committed to that. We believe it's truth. We know it's truth. And so we, we hope if we can encourage even one person, it's all worth it. Absolutely. Can I get an amen? Amen. <laughs> <laughs> With that in mind, let's, let's hit it. And so I'm essentially going to share three reasons why this question is not a threat to God creating the universe. The question is, well, who made God? So the first reason that I think this question is not a threat is because the atheist or the agnostic has to struggle with the same question. They believe there, there is no God. In the case of the atheist, the skeptic, you might say it's possible, but essentially they, uh, they refuse this creator. Well, they've got the same issues. So they would have to say that somehow the universe on its own, somehow natural processes or something else created everything. So if I use the same logic, I can come right back to them and say, well, what created them? And so that's one of the reasons is they're, they're stuck in that same conundrum. And I'll tell you, some of the things that these folks have come up with, everything <laughs> from, well, there were aliens from somewhere else that came at one point, billions of years ago and got this all started, in which case you say, okay, where did those aliens come from? Yeah. Um, also, another thing we've touched on, but I'm going to go to this a little bit in depth, multiverse theory. And uh, that's something that's been kind of growing probably the last couple decades or so. But it's this idea that there are all these universes, maybe even an infinite number, sometimes called parallel universes. It makes for great science fiction movies. And I, <laughs> and I, and I, and I enjoy science fiction. So I I like kind of thinking about these things. You know what I call it? What? It's multi-excuse theory. <laughs> yeah, multi-excuse. That's, that's really not, good. Not to believe in God, but, but I digress. Go ahead, Joe. You no, know, that's good. And since one of them's called string theory, they're trying to string you along with the multi-excuse <laughs> theories. We're incredible, Darren. We're on fire. But one maybe, of these... Maybe I'm... Uh, maybe I'm redeeming my philosophical arguments. <laughs> that, that, that could be. Not really. <laughs> you know, but just to give you an idea of, of how these things play out, um, one idea of these parallel universes says that space is so big that the rules of probability imply that surely somewhere else out there are other planets exactly like Earth. In fact, an infinite universe would have infinitely many planets. And on some of them, the events that play out would be virtually identical to those on our Earth. So... If you follow that to its logical conclusion, you still have the same problem on any of those potential possible Earths or universes. Absolutely. The whole thing started, so it doesn't solve anything, even if it were true. Yeah. So that's kind of a, a level one parallel universe theory. There's a level two parallel universe, which says regions of space are continuing to undergo an inflation phase. Because of the continuing inflationary phase in these universes, space between us and the other universes is literally expanding faster than the speed of light, and they are therefore completely unreachable. <laughs> now, now, does that sound more logical to you, or does it sound more logical to say, hey, maybe there is some being that got this whole thing started? It's, it sounds like me when, uh, I can't remember the podcast, one of our earlier ones, when I was trying to argue that if we're just a speck. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> remember that wisdom I, there? I, I remember it well. <laughs> but... It does fit the same sort of logic that regardless, if it's an infinite universe, no matter what you throw at it, you're still getting back to, to how did it get here? Right. 
And if right. it's a multi-universe, well, how did they get here? And, and right. you could just go on and on. And so. Right. And, and another thing we've touched on a little bit, but I think it's worth bringing up is, you know, you go back to the very first verse, of the Bible in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, for a, a long time, a lot of people that studied science and, and uh, cosmology and thought about these things did believe the universe was infinite. But I don't think there's uh, really anyone who, who believes that anymore because there's so much, so much evidence that there was a, a beginning event. Um, and so that idea of saying, well, it just has been here all along, that really goes away too. So that's yeah. number one, again, that they're stuck in that same problem of they would say for us, it's who created God. Well, for them, it's who, who got this started. How did these natural processes work? How did it evolve? So number two, I want to give a credit to really a couple of people. William Lane Craig, we've mentioned him before. Um, Frank Turek. Was another apologist, and also John Lennox. Um, I think I may have mentioned him another time, but some of this that I'm stating is is kind of a composite of some different things they've said because they just had a really good way of putting it. So number two is this. It's not necessary to explain an explanation in order for that explanation to be the best one. And that's kind of a mouthful, so I'm going to read it again. It's not necessary to explain an explanation in order for that explanation to be the best one. So here are just some, some real-life examples. Um, I walk into an art gallery, and I see a bunch of paintings. Well, the best explanation is that someone painted those paintings, regardless of whether or not I know anything at all about the painter. And see what these atheists and skeptics are saying is you basically have to tell us all kinds of things about this God in order for him to be the, ex the best explanation. But you don't. I'm a piece of music, the same thing. I can know so that somebody wrote it. That's the best explanation without knowing anything about the composer or the writer of the song. Another thing here that you can think of is, let's say that, that you found an ancient civilization somewhere, and you might find um, tools, you might find artwork, you might find writings, all these things. And again, the best explanation is that there were people there who lived and, and built those things, and that doesn't mean you have to know anything at all about those people. So I think that's, that's another place where their argument falls flat. Yeah, John Lennox is really good. I like listening to him. And of course, you said William Lane Craig. Now, I thought you knew him personally as Bill. <laughs> well, we had a little bit of a, a falling out. Um, I, in one of our recent debates, he was simply unable to even come close to answering the philosophical. Oh. Uh, yeah, no sorry. One, no I, one's buying it. No one's buying it. Sorry, I asked. <laughs> now, if he, if he gets back in my good graces, I may consider calling oh. him Bill once again. <laughs> That that's good though what you're what you're talking about because obviously none of us are can explain all of it but we do right. see the evidence of the, of that truth we do see the evidence of creation to be able to explain all of it we we just don't know now we as Christians of course we're going to go to the Word of God and whatever's been revealed to us and like we said in one of our other podcasts there are scientific evidences in the Bible there are things there that show the uh, providence of God, and, and we see that, but it's not a scientific book. So right. we, can't, we can't argue from that perspective, even though, we, like I said, there are some good evidences in there. Well, what's really interesting is that, you know, I think anybody that will really look at the creation honestly, I mean, it'd be pretty hard to imagine someone saying it just doesn't look designed in any way, shape, or fashion. <laughs> and the interesting thing is even, and I've heard Dawkins say that, and, and something I watched with him, this was several years ago, but he actually said to whoever was interviewing him, I know it looks designed, but it isn't designed. <laughs> now, that, now that's probably really, I may have, he may have just unfriended me too. He and William Lane <laughs> Craig may be over somewhere talking about how they don't like me anymore because that was probably a bad imitation. But even he said, yes, it does look designed, but it isn't. Well, I want to share one other quote that I dug up here. This is a Richard, I'm probably going to say his name, last name wrong, Lewontin, Richard Lewontin. Listen to what he says here. Again, a guy who's a I don't know if he's an atheist or just a skeptic, but he's honest. But he says, our willingness to accept scientific claims that are against common sense is the key to an understanding of the struggle between science and the supernatural. He says, we take the side of science in spite of the absurdity of some of its constructs. I and mean, then he ends up saying, because we have a prior commitment to materialism. So again, there's a guy that's just blatantly honest. Listen to one more from a guy named Niles Eldridge. He says, we paleontologists have said that the history of life supports the story of gradual adaptation 
adaptation. <laughs> oh no, I did it, oh. Darren. Uh oh, <laughs> I did it. I can't. Hey, do you it. know what? I'm going to give you a pass because this is. I'm. I'm so interested in the in the subject. We're just going to let the. Uh, All right. You're well, catching up with me though. I I can still say <laughs> philanthropist though. You've, you've got it. You've and got for that. The, for those who don't know, go back and listen to podcasts. I believe it was number two, and you'll know yep. why Joel and I are are laughing that, about that. that. Go ahead. But he, but he ends up saying, "Here, I'm going to start that over." We paleontologists have said that the history of life supports the story of gradual adaptive change, knowing all the while that it does not. So here are these guys that are they're they're being honest. And then getting back to your to your point, it, it is designed. We can see that. We can know that. And the reason people object to that is is not because of a lack. of evidence. I believe it's actually because of a heart issue. And we're going to get to that. Yeah, I'd actually wrote down here to make a note to to say something earlier before you even brought that up. And my note simply says worldview. Yeah. And you could also say presupposition. Yeah. You you could throw many terms at that to to explain that it's not that the evidence isn't there. But if you're not willing to just take the evidence and then try to take off your worldview glasses to examine that evidence, because if, if you're just going in with a naturalistic explanation and you're not going to allow for the supernatural or whatever right. it is you're not going to allow, then then you have to automatically discard that. And, and let me just say, all of us have our presuppositions, so I'm not going to sit here and pretend because I know the atheists will get all fired up and say, oh, well, you got your presuppositions too, but... I will say, and I, I really do try to do this, when I listen to Christians and, and atheist debates, and, and I do listen to the other side, and I do try to think, okay, where are they coming from? What, what are they saying? What is their approach? So, and to be fair, I have seen some atheists who will do the same and, and at least admit when a point's been made. I actually heard a guy just the other day say that William Lane Craig, that most of his arguments that he really has found that it's really hard to, to debunk. Yeah, and this guy's yeah. a skeptic. So I thought that was uh, he said something like that. Uh, he's still a skeptic, though. So he obviously you right. know, become a Christian. But it's just good to see that that, that someone that's saying, "Hey, you know, I recognize that argument." Right, right. And uh, moving on to the the third reason why this argument falls flat from Dawkins' book, and this is one that's near and dear to Christians, especially. So again, this question is: Well, if God created everything, who made God? So here's my third point. The Bible doesn't claim that God was created. And that's why on its face, the question doesn't even make sense because he's, he's asking Christians to tell him who made God when Christians don't believe that anyone made God. The Bible claims God is eternal, sometimes called the uncaused first cause. Since the Bible doesn't claim God is created, but is eternal, the question who created God, again, is asking a question that can't be answered because it's asking a Christian to defend a belief they don't even hold. What I wanted to do, Darren, is, is just go into, I've got four scriptures here. They're just about a verse each, but, but just from a variety of places in the Bible that do tell us that indeed scripture claims an eternal God. So one is from Isaiah. It says, do you not know, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. And then from Psalm 90, which I happened to be reading this morning, before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. In John 1.1, 1, 1, a lot of our listeners might know this verse, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So that's claiming that, that Christ was there also from the very beginning. And then 1 Timothy 1.17, love this verse. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And so again, the Bible claims that, that God is eternal. And I think that that's what we would expect as, as Christians, that this God who is so worthy of worship has always been there. He's made that very clear to us um, many places all over Scripture. Hallelujah! Yeah, I think people are thinking right now, thinking, well, you really ain't answered the question. Well, yes, you just did answer the question because we're going beyond what science has supposedly found. And yet, in a way, we're not because if they go back to this Big Bang, which is still the majority opinion, something had to start that. And time comes out of the Big Bang. So what's before time? What's beyond all this? We know that something had to create it because our natural laws, the things that we know now, the things that we understand had to have a creator. Right, right. And if you go back to what they're saying, they're basically just saying that, that they don't know that I mean, they don't have an answer. And so I'm fine with saying God created it. That makes more sense to me. I don't have enough faith to say I don't know. You got that right. That's an amen for sure. Right. All right, brother. Sorry, we're, we're about out of time. Why don't you take us home? 
I will. I just want to mention one more verse. Mention it on another podcast, but it's so important. Psalm 14, verse 1 says, The fool says in his heart, there is no God. Here's what's interesting about that. When you go back to the original language, the Hebrew, it's basically saying there is no judge. And so many people might be open to the idea of some general God of some sort, maybe even a creator, but they simply don't want the accountability. Again, it's not a lack of evidence. It's a heart issue that keeps people from seeing and worshiping this God who created everything we see. Woo-hoo! All right, Joel, great podcast. Loved it. That was good. Thank you. All right. Hey, thanks for listening, folks. Listening to the Flaming Sword. Until next time, remember, love the sheep. Bam. Shoot the wolves. <laughs>